Okay, thank you very much. Uh, dear speakers and moderators, uh, and organizers, I will be letting participants in from the, uh, we'll be opening up the webinar to participants in five, four, three, two, one. Hello all, and welcome to today's APFSD site event, Air Pollution in Asia and Asia Pacific, Black Carbon, the Dark Side of Human Activity. Um, thank you all very much for being here a little bit early. We will officially get started in a few moments here. Um, we've opened the webinar up a little bit early so that um, attendees can start streaming in and arriving into the virtual room. Thank you for your patience. We'll be getting started in a few moments here. It is now um, approximately 3 p.m. Bangkok time. Um, hello to all of you. My name is Irene and I'm uh, the technical facilitator uh, supporting today's webinar to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Please uh, submit any questions that you may have for the panel and for the organizers into the Q&A window. We highly encourage your participation, your inputs and comments in the chat. So please use that space um, to uh, maximize the opportunity within that space. And to officially get uh, this webinar started, I would like to now welcome uh, Ibu Armida, the SCAP Executive Secretary to the floor to give us some opening remarks. Over to you, Ibu Armida. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Good afternoon from Bangkok. Uh, let me start by extending my appreciation and thanks to the Embassy of France and Japan for hosting this important site event on a topic of urgency in our region, which is air pollution. Our region, as all of us know, is the contributor of more than 50% of global CO2 emission. This is reflected in basically most of the 100, uh, the, the most polluted cities are in Asia. According to WHO, more than 90% of the region's population is exposed to the levels of air pollution that has significant risk to their health and well-being. The health effects of air pollution have, have been immense, and air pollution is, uh, or direct impacts on human health have been revealed through the rates of premature death, infant mortality, and mental health issues. Air pollution's indirect effect on human health is also have been uh, reflected in lost work hours and decreased labor productivity. The pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has made the issue even more urgent. We know from an increasing number of studies, information that long-term exposure to high levels of air pollution may contribute to increase vulnerabilities to COVID-19 or the impact can be more severe. The challenge for us all is how to ensure that recovery post-COVID-19 will lead to an economy and society that is more resilient, inclusive and sustainable, and certainly cleaner in terms of air quality. May I share several key areas where we can further strengthen our work and collaboration in this regard. The first one is on innovative means to solution. In this regard, SCAP is utilizing several new means such as machine learning, remote sensing, satellite imagery, and et cetera, to provide cities with insight into the specific causes of air pollution uh, that, that impact their city, citizens. This information will then can be utilized by the leaders, city leaders, with the data that they need and information they need to come up with the right solutions to their pollution challenges. Second area is we need to further strengthen regional cooperation. As all of us uh, realize, air pollution is transboundary in nature. 
whether from the various sources, agriculture residue, transport, industrial activity, or power plant. Pollutants can travel uh, uh, across, across jurisdiction, across boundaries, and definitely across countries. Therefore, strengthened regional cooperation among countries is needed to address this problem. And the last one is protect and restore ecosystem. Greening our cities, protecting and expanding natural areas and promoting nature-based solutions will all improve air quality. In today's session, we will cover all these topics and much more. I look forward to hearing your views and deliberation as well as solution. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to open this important side event jointly organized by France, Japan, and the UN HESCAP Environmental and Development Division in the context of the 8th Asia-Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development. The COVID-19 crisis, which started more than one year ago, has clearly showed the interconnection between animal and human health and the strong links with biodiversity, climate change, and pollution. From now on, it is urgent to aggregate those issues into new concepts and encourage a more systemic approach to properly manage and address challenges to be implemented in all sectors for a sustainable future of our planet. For France, issues related to climate change and biodiversity are at the top of our agenda. Regarding climate change, much progress has been made since 2015 and the adoption of the first Universal Climate Agreement, also known as the Paris Agreement. The European Union is committed to achieve climate neutrality by 2050 and the reduction of its greenhouse gas emission by 55% by 2030 as compared to 1990. Last December, at the Climate Ambition Summit, more than 70 countries made ambition announcements. For this year, our objective is to make COP26 a success and finalize the rules for the implementation of a Paris Agreement. In addition to that, it is important to strengthen climate finance and to meet the expectations and the needs of the most vulnerable countries. On the occasion of a Climate Ambition Summit, France has pledged to spend 6 billion euros a year on its climate development aid, a third of which more specifically on adaptation actions. With rapid industrialization and urbanization, Southeast Asian countries, which are home to a very significant biodiversity, face all those challenges. They also face serious economic and health issues, especially in their poorest areas. In this context, the nexus of biodiversity animal and human, and human health and climate change need specific attention. The Southeast Asia region is at the heart of the inclusive French Indo-Pacific strategy based on multilateralism and cooperation, especially on global issues with countries and institutions. This strategy is being implemented through expertise to raise awareness on major stakeholders regarding the environmental challenges I have just mentioned. France is willing to be more involved in Asia and the Pacific through further systemic research and leverage of political will and capacity building. We can build upon recent governmental initiatives such as pre on the One Health approach 
which was launched at the One Planet Summit on Biodiversity last January by the President of the French Republic. France also believes approaches such as planetary health and projects dealing with climate, plastic and air pollution can also make a very useful contribution to the sustainable development in the region. I believe this forum and the foresight events on air pollution, marine plastic pollution, carbon neutrality and the nexus biodiversity, ecosystem, health and climate, which the French Embassy is co-organizing, will facilitate transdisciplinary discussions in the context of a crisis we are currently facing. Those events build upon the presence in Thailand of several French experts from our major research center like CIRAD, CNRS and RID and also experts based in France. Therefore, I would like to thank ESCAP, in particular its Environment and Development Division, for the opportunity offered to both Japan and France to share this original contribution and expertise to decision and makers and other stakeholders. I have no doubt that this opportunity will be a milestone to further reinforce collaboration and synergies and collectively address future challenges in a context marked by extremely rapid ecological and social changes and the need to build back better in the post-COVID context. Thank you. Dear fellow participants, good afternoon. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you at the discussion on air pollution in Southeast Asia. I thank our French friends for their excellent collaboration with great support by the UNSCAP Secretariat. Merci beaucoup. Air pollution is one of today's most pressing environmental issues. We cannot live without clean air, which is essential to a healthy and fulfilling life. Japan itself has previously experienced severe air pollution. In 1970s, with rapid industrialization, sulfur dioxide emitted by heavy industry was our main concern. And in 1980s, uh, nitrogen dioxide from huge numbers of motor vehicles became a major source of air pollution. By the early 2000s, responding to the need of reinforcing our policies on particulate matters such as SPM and the PM2.5, we introduced strict regulation on emissions from road vehicles. And as a result of those measures, air quality in Japan is now much better than it was in the past. Recently, we have been working closely with other countries in Asia Pacific region, bilaterally and multilaterally. Japan took a leading role in the establishment of the Asia Deposition Monitoring Network in East Asia, known as EANET in the early 2000s. But we need to do more. Air pollution remains one of the most serious environmental problems for many countries. It is estimated that each year more than 6 million people worldwide die uh, prematurely as a consequence of air pollution. Furthermore, it is said that there might be a correlation between air pollution and the transmission and the severity of COVID-19 infection. In addition, substances such as black carbon are one of the driving factors for climate change. In order to achieve two, 2030 SDGs, we have to do the more to address the issue as quickly as possible. Time is running out. I do hope that today's event will get traction from participating international stakeholders and further serve to promote our countermeasures to improve air quality. 
Thank you very much. We would like to thank the French Embassy in Thailand in cooperation with the Embassy of Japan and UNSCAP for inviting the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to speak on the linkages between air pollution, climate and health. Many of us know that air pollution is the deadliest environmental health risk for humans. Those exposed to high levels of pollutants can experience increased mortality from things like stroke, heart disease, lung disease and cancer. According to the 2018 Air Pollution Solutions Report by the CCAC, UNEP, and the Asia-Pacific Clean Air Partnership, 92% of the Asia-Pacific population, or about 4 billion people, are exposed to unsafe levels of air pollution. It also concludes that existing policies can reduce pollution, but are not enough to reach safe levels. The 71 country partners and more than 100 civil society partners of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition propose an approach that integrates actions on air pollution and climate change, such as those that target short-lived climate pollutants or SLCPs, while complementing efforts to mitigate CO2. SLCPs have important impacts on our climate and the quality of our air. They have a short lifetime in the atmosphere, from a few days to a few decades. Action reduces concentrations quickly, and immediate benefits are felt where action is taken. The SLCP's methane, black carbon, and tropospheric ozone are the most important contributors to current global warming after CO2. Hydrofluorocarbons are currently small, but are projected to rise up to 19% of total CO2 emissions by 2050. Black carbon and copollutants make up for the majority of PM2.5, one of the leading causes of ill health and premature death. Ozone pollution or smog is responsible for the loss of more than 100 million tons of crops per year, jeopardizing food security. The great news is that we know the solutions and technologies. Most air pollutants and greenhouse gases are co-emitted from the same sources, so we can address them together. So to build back better, we should address climate, air pollution, and sustainable development as an integrated problem. We can help identify technologies, lifestyle changes, fiscal and policy solutions, which will achieve multiple near-term benefits efficiently and often at lower cost than solutions that do not consider both the economy and the environment. This has always been the core message of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Our mission is to put the world in a pathway that rapidly reduces warming in the near term and maximizes benefits by catalyzing fast action to reduce SLCPs. We are very honored to be working arm in arm with countries and organizations in the Asia Pacific region as well as globally, many of them attending this event. Thank you very much. Hello, and welcome to Black Carbon, the Dark Side of Human Activity, a side event in the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. My name is Abigail Smith, and I am a Sustainable Development Consultant with UNSCAP. I will be moderating today's session. This event was co-planned by SCAP with the French and Japanese embassies, and I want to start by thanking the three representatives who gave us opening remarks. Ibu Armida, the SCAP Executive Secretariat, Mr. Terry Mathieu, the French Ambassador, and Mr. Nishida Kazua, the Ambassador of Japan. Also, thanks to Denise San Valentin, the Program Management Officer for the Secretariat for CCAC. Denise touched on many important points that we will expand upon throughout today's session, particularly that air pollution is an integrated problem. In addressing it requires working in tangent with sustainable development and climate change action. It will also take adopting new technologies, making lifestyle ad adjustments, in major shifts in fiscal and policy planning. We will be joined by a panel of experts on air pollution to unpack more health, social, and economic impacts created by this threat. And we will be looking at some of the best practices in monitoring public information and policy implementation. Please be sure to stay with us through the entirety of the session because Dr. Maria Nara, the Director of the Department of Environment, Climate Change, and Health 
at the WHO is joining us live from Geneva for special closing remarks. Before moving to the panel, I wanna tell you about one of UN SCAP's ongoing air pollution initiatives in Asia and the Pacific. This project was developed following the adoption of a resolution put forward by the Republic of Korea at the 75th ASCAP Commission session in 2019, with the mission to strengthen regional cooperation in order to tackle air pollution challenges in the region. The project was created because of many of us know, air quality, particularly in many urban areas in this region, is at unsatisfactory levels. It is damaging to our health, to our climate, and to our economy. In order for the region to meet the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable, de sustainable Development, particularly three, good health and well-being, and 11, sustainable cities and communities, air pollution must be reduced. And the right tools, approach, and support are required for the region to get there. The goal of this project is to give policymakers and stakeholders those tools so they can implement effective decisions for their city, region, and country. We work with pilot cities throughout the region to help them develop action plans that can swiftly make long-lasting changes, which will make the air safe in the region for generations to come. One of the ways this project will work towards meeting our goals is by enhancing awareness on the topic for individuals, corporations, governments, and civil society. This September, we'll see the second International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies, an annual day designated by the United Nations General Assembly following a resolution brought forward by the Republic of Korea. The mission of this event is to emphasize the need to make further efforts to improve air quality to protect human health. ASCAP will be hosting events and campaigns to raise public awareness at all levels, promote and facilitate solutions, including lessons learned and results from this project, and we will bring together diverse international actors working on related topics to form a strategic alliance and gain momentum for national, regional, and international plans on effective air quality management. At the core of our project lies in helping policymakers apply science-based measures that can have an impact in quality of life for millions across the region. The 2019 UNAP-CCAC report identified 25 proven and cost-effective measures that if implemented could give 1 billion people living in Asia access to clean air by 2030. The policy recommendations in this list represent the framework of what our project is trying to achieve throughout the region, identifying the most appropriate solutions for cities based on their context. But instead of listening to me tell you about all 25 of these measures, I'd like to share a short video. So I've just been notified that there's no sound. So please give me one second to put the sound on. Thank you very much for your patience.
So those measures all seem reasonable, but not all of them are the right fit to every region or city. For instance, a town with low population and low traffic, but high air pollution may benefit from strengthening vehicle inspection and emissions, but they will need other types of policy measures as well in order to see the change they are striving for in air quality. While a bustling city with millions of motor vehicles on the road may have far greater gains in their battle than the small town from enforcing those same exact regulations. For policymakers to decide which of those measures has the potential for the most positive impact on their particular air pollution problem, we must first identify the source. So how do we identify the main sources of pollution for any given area? Well, samples of what is in the air can be broken down into different chemical components. These components often relate to specific industries that produce it. For, in for instance, nitrous oxide or NOx is often related to engine emissions. So by studying the chemical components in air samples, you can create a unique fingerprint of each city or region's air pollution makeup. This fingerprint can help, help in identifying potential sources of air pollution, just like a fingerprint in a crime scene. But just like a crime investigation, fingerprints are not enough to plead a case. To narrow the search down further, we analyze fingerprints against other specific trends. For example, wind speed and direction or monsoon season versus dry season, the proximity of industrial activities, traffic patterns, and other factors to find correlations with the air pollution problem. So let's take a look at an example city. Chiang Mai, Thailand. This is one of the pilot cities for this particular SCAP initiative. The fingerprint in this graph is taken during November to April, their dry season, or what we call air pollution season. As historically, pollution rises so bad during this time of year, the views from the mountaintops down to the city are obstructed by haze. In this graph, the red horizontal line indicates when the air quality level surpasses healthy recommendations from the WHO. And it is obvious that PM 2.5 is the main threat. However, this alone does not identify the main source. So next we look at more trends and patterns in the region to further explore potential causes. And while there was ample evidence pointing to biomass burning as the main source of seasonal air pollution in Chiang Mai, one of the most astounding correlations discovered to prove this was between the number of open burning spots in the region on any given day in the daily PM 2.5 re readings of the city. This, the, the graphs in this slide illustrate that point. Please see that they do not run on a standard calendar year, but instead center around this known air pollution season so that the trend is more visible. The upper graph is the annual reading of PM 2.5 in Chiang Mai, spiking well beyond healthy levels for months with peaks in March through April. The graph on the bottom shows the number of hotspots or burning areas detected, by, detected in the region by MODIS satellites with peaks of burning occurring in March and April. Their connection is undeniable. We have studied these hotspots further and concluded that they are predominantly human created fires. And for this region, most of the fires appear to be from the burning of agricultural waste. It is as it is a common practice for farmers here, even though straw can be a valuable resource if not burned. Unfortunately though, most farmers in the region do not possess the right tools to make use of this resource. All of this evidence helps us to design the most appropriate and integrated policy interventions that will tackle the largest share of pollutants while also reducing other outer line sources. And now that we know all that we know about Chiang Mai, we can refer back to those 25 clean air measures and pick a starting point to get the region on track to meet its 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And for the Chiang Mai region, we will begin by focusing on the measures that address agriculture and fires. Particularly measure 21, better management of agricultural crop residue, or more simply said, redu reducing open fires to almost zero. As discussed, most of the burning that happens in that region is done to dispose of agricultural waste or to clear land. And this is a really complicated issue. Many regional farms do this because they believe it is the only option to produce high yielding crops cost effectively. However, we know that there are actually ways to manage this waste better that saves time, money, and our lungs. But support is required to get the agricultural sector to adopt these methods and make the needed changes. 
which is exactly what SCAP's program CSAM, the Center for Sustainable Agricultural Mechanism, is working on with farmers throughout the Asia Pacific region. CSAM is building capacity in the agriculture sector to train on alternate uses of strawways that do not emit PM 2.5. They're doing this through communication and awareness raising on available technologies, research, advisory, and training in the region, and importantly, building partnerships and fostering cooperation. CSAM is also employing a circular design methodology in their gardens guidance for farmers. Straw actually can be very valuable if managed appropriately, and by building capacity and highlighting the economic benefits of sustainable integrated straw management, we give the farmers more options and tools to make more money. These practices include using straw as fertilizer and fodder, sustainable mushroom practices, and biogas production. But Chiang Mai is just one example of how we're identifying the sources to apply the right measures. Not all areas or cities are the same even when in close proximity to each other. Take, for example, Chiang Mai's fingerprint compared to Bangkok and Hanoi. While PM 2.5 is a problem for all areas, by examining these fingerprints carefully, you find indicators that can lead to other contributing factors. For instance, the fingerprint of the air pollution in Bangkok has higher NOx and SOx than Chiang Mai. Those are pollutants associated with traffic and industrial activities. So that means this region still needs to make improvement on emission standards and manufacturing regulations in tangent, of course, with other policies. The fingerprint of the air pollution in Hanoi has higher SOx and carbon monoxide than Chiang Mai. When taking into consideration the proximity of coal power plants to Hanoi, we can assume that they are the culprits behind those elevated numbers. In closing, in order to save energy, resources, and lives, it is imperative that we work to find the right policies and use the appropriate mechanisms to meet our goal of clean air for all. And while I would love to tell you more about what UNS CAP's Air Pollution Initiative is uncovering and working towards, time today is limited, and we have an amazing panel of experts waiting to join us. There will be time for questions and answers at the end, but in the meantime, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section of this Zoom webinar, and we will answer as many as we can at the end live, and follow up with anything else afterwards. But now, let's bring our panelists out. So Irene, if you could bring our panelists on board. Yes, let me go ahead and spotlight all of them at once. Great, so while our panelists all come on board, I'm gonna ask them to each introduce themselves um, and when you introduce yourself, take about a minute. And I would also love if you could tell our audience a little bit about what you're working on today. So uh, if we, if you don't mind, Karine Leguer of Air Paris. Yes, good morning. Uh Good morning. Good, good morning. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here today and to uh, speak about this very important issue, which is air pollution and which is even more important during the pandemic that we are experiencing right now. Um, I'm the CEO of Fair Paris. Fair Paris is the independent organization in charge of monitoring air pollution for more than we have been working in Paris region for more than 40 years. We are in charge of monitoring, uh, following the different trends and the footprints you are speaking about in, in Paris region, which is also developing and changing um, during, uh, depending on, on, on the sources. Um, we are in charge of informing the citizens, uh, the, the local authorities, but also uh, the NGO, the media, the polluters. We are in charge also of supporting innovation because innovation can also help to um, better improve air pollution faster. And we are in charge of uh, helping the local authorities in making the diagnosis regarding air pollution and climate change and designing their um, mitigation plans. So that, that's what we have been doing for 40 years. Great, thank you so much. Next, I'd like to bring onto the floor Dr. Kim On of the Asia Institute of Technology right here in Bangkok. Hi, Kim. Hi, Dr. Kim, welcome. Yeah, Hello everyone, I'm Kim Wang from the Asian Institute of Technology. You see AAT background behind me. So um, 
Yeah, I'm a professor at IIT and I've been doing research on air quality, air pollution, uh, monitoring, modeling, emission inventory, and let, uh, on the co-benefit of the emission reduction for both air quality and climate purpose. So um, that is, so uh, I'm doing a lot of field work in Southeast Asia and beyond. So uh, conducting a lot of projects and uh, very nice to meet you all today and hope to talk to you more later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. And next I'd like to bring to the floor, uh, Dr. Satoro joining us today from Japan. Hi, mm. welcome. Yeah, hi. Okay, so my name is Satoru Chatani from National Institute for Environmental Studies, NYS in Japan. So I'm a researcher uh, mainly working on uh, pollutant emission inventories and also air quality uh, simulation for Japan and also Asian countries. And also I am a member of uh, Japan Thailand Clean Air Partnerships. Thank you. Great, thank you. And next up, I'd like to bring Dr. Pat from the Pollution Control Department here in Bangkok on to introduce herself. Hi, Dr. Pat. I think you have yourself on mute. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pachalavadi Suvanathada. Uh, right now, my position is expert on air quality and noise management. I work for air quality and noise management division uh, under the pollution Control Department, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Thailand. And I myself, uh, my work is mainly involved in air quality management, air pollution control, and like ambient air quality monitoring. Yes, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. We're glad to have you with us. And our last but not least panelist today, Dr. Xavier Mari, joining us today from France. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Abigail. So I am an oceanographer, I mean, a marine scientist working at the France National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, the IRD. So the IRD is a multidisciplinary research institute working in partnership with developing countries and addressing priorities in line with the sustainable development goals. And the IRD scientists actually work in 50 or so countries, including countries in Asia Pacific region. Myself, I'm actually on posting in Vietnam, in Hanoi, where I have been working on fine particular pollution for several years now. And to be more accurate, I work on a specific kind of particle present within PM2.5 that are the soot particles, also called black carbon. So these particles are produced during combustion processes, uh, in other words, in fire. So in fire used to generate energy, but also in fire used to clean up waste. So actually when something is burned, no matter what, a lot of things are emitted, so in atmosphere, mostly a, a gas, well, you all know about carbon dioxide, and this particle, the black carbon, which is one of the major constituents of PM2.5. Actually, black carbon is a key contaminant pre present in PM2.5 and is known to impact health, but it also impact climate and ecosystem. So these black carbon particles are actually very interesting because they are a tracer of combustion processes. That means by analyzing them, you can identify the sources of combustion and the sector that has produced them. And as you know, identifying the sources of air pollution is a key step in reducing, uh, reducing emission. Thank you. Absolutely, and, and Dr. Maria, I'd, I'd like to stay with you. I, I think that you bring a really interesting perspective here with your background in oceanography. And we're talking a lot about how air pollution is an integrated problem. And I'm hoping that you can explain to us how PM 2.5 is connected to our waterways and what the cost of that is economically and for an individual. Essentially, what happens to PM 2.5? Well, I'm pretty sure most of you are wondering why is an oceanographer doing here uh, participate, yeah, participating to this side event on air pollution? Uh, well, we are supposed to talk about air pollution. So we are all very, all very interested in PM2.5, especially because it has detrimental effects on our health. But we are all very interested to find solution to remove those particles from this, the, the atmosphere and make sure they do not enter into the, our lungs, uh, lungs. So I have excellent news. Well, I know a solution to remove them from the atmosphere. Actually, it's very simple. You just wait a few days and they will leave the atmosphere by themselves. Actually, by definition, these PM2.5 are particles 
which means that thanks to the universal, universal law of gravity, they do not stay very long in the, in the atmosphere. They stay uh, roughly between one, two weeks in the atmosphere. And after they leave the atmosphere via dry and wet deposition on lands and the oceans. And the large part of these particles deposited on lands then reaches the ocean via rivers, actually. Actually, the ocean is the main repository of PM2.5. In terms of mass, I mean, in terms of quantity, the amount of PM2.5 that arrives to the ocean largely exceeds that of plastic waste. But contrary to plastic waste, it goes totally unnoticed. Anyway, why should we care about what is happening to PM2.5 particles when they have left the atmosphere? Well, maybe we should care, actually, because the detrimental impact are not limited to what they do to or else when they are in the atmosphere. Of course, those particles do not have spectacular effect as plastic waste does when they arrive in the ocean. They don't kill turtles or whales, and they do not make our beaches look like open dumps. But actually, once they are in the ocean, those particles interact with biological and chemical and physical processes controlling several marine ecosystem services such as the ability of the ocean to pump atmospheric carbon dioxide and regulate the climate, and also the ability of the ocean to produce resources and ensure livelihood of human population. So finally, you asked me about the cost. Well, uh, in order to eval evaluate the cost related to the impact of a specific pollution on an ecosystem, first, it is necessary to assign an economical value to each service that this ecosystem provides. And second, it's necessary to determine the extent of the damages induced by this pollution on each of the services provided by the ecosystem. So as you know, most of the time, we are not even aware of the services an ecosystem provides. And when we do, we consider these services as free. Unfortunately, we usually realize the value of an ecosystem service once the ecosystem is not able anymore to provide it properly. Well, therefore, I cannot really come up with an estimated cost for this pollution. But just you have to remember to, to, to really to keep in mind that this is the major uh, amount of pollutant arriving in the ocean and in other actually uh, water uh, bodies. And it goes unnoticed, but in terms of uh, impact, it has a very strong impact. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mari. Do any of our other panelists want to comment on that before we move on? No? Great. Well, I want to talk to Dr. Pat from the PCD next year, uh, from the Pollution Control Department in Thailand next. Um, Dr. Pat, so Dr. Mari was just talking about our oceans, and we know that this is really important to Thailand, Thai culture, um, the food that we eat, and, and the way that we live here in, in Thailand. And what I'm hoping you can enlighten us on is uh, a little bit about what's happening with Thailand's research and development, particularly around PM 2.5 and its sources. I'm also hoping you can tell us a little bit about what you're working on, um, particularly any collaborations coming forward in the future to start to battle PM 2.5. Dr. Pat? Uh Okay, thank you. Uh, let me say something a little bit about air quality issue in Thailand. Uh, in uh, now today, what we have as uh, air pollution issues is include PM two point five, PM ten, ozone, and also benzene. And as uh, everyone mentioned before, uh, in Thailand, PM two point five is uh, right now is a uh, we can say it's a major air pollution in, in many areas. Uh, maybe not, not in every province in Thailand, but in uh, many areas, we have the problem of PM2.5. And in Thailand, uh, uh, when we study and try to investigate uh, emission source of, air, of PM2.5, we found that it comes from uh, many sectors. Uh, for example, transport sector, which we have uh, many of the diesel vehicles uh, registered in, in Thailand. I, I think uh, maybe half of the vehicle registered in Thailand is diesel. Uh -huh. And we also have the major contribution from open burnings. And if you look at, at uh, the map or the information on hotspot, we found that we have uh, 
hotspots nationwide, but mainly we find it in like in the forest, uh, both in reserve forest and also conservation forest, and as well as in agricultural area also. Uh, in addition to transport, when burning, we have industry, uh, we have construction, and we also have transboundary air pollution, which in Thailand, in the northern part, we found that the air pollution episode during January and April, which is now today. <laughs> and in the southern part, uh, we found it uh, in the end of the year between like June or September. And since because uh, it, it increasing, in increasing sorry interest from the public. So in Thailand, the government declared that PM 2.5 is a national agenda. Back in like October 2019, the Prime Minister uh, also said that, that PM 2.5, right now we have many areas that exceed the standard. So we have to uh, seriously take care of that. So in Thailand, we have like, we call it Thailand National Agenda for PM 2.5 Reduction Action Plan which we have major three measures. The first one is uh, try to increase uh, eff effectiveness of control measures on area base, which uh, we are divided in like a critical period. Before that, during critical period, and after that, after the criti critical period, we will have like after action review, try to find lesson learned from what we did, uh, what we have to do next, something like that. And the second measure is the control and minimization of air pollutant emissions at source of control emission source. The third one is the improving management efficiency of air pollution. One of the example that we would like to say to share here for uh, increase the uh, effectiveness is a pilot project on we call it biomass check control uh, collect and use, which uh, we have it. Uh, focused on the area in the northern part of Thailand, which right now we have it include like 17 provinces and uh, in the northern part and some other partic participate provinces in the other part, like in the northeastern. The objective of this uh, pilot project on biomass burn check, collect and use is to reduce biomass in the forest, uh, uh, including uh, reserve forest and also conservation forest, as well as in agricultural areas. And the second objective is try to increase the efficiency of forest fry for prevention and enhance the collaboration among government agency, private sector, and public community. For us, the ultimate goal of this project is try to reduce open burning. That's yeah, what we want. And the target, uh, we want to have at least a thousand tons of the biomass burning uh, in 2021. And uh, good news to us, in some provinces that they have many how to say, uh, they have maybe more forest than the other, they collect more than the target already at this time, then, but we say, uh, keep it, uh, continue keep it. And you may wonder what they want, they use for use uh, after we collect it from the forest. They have many alternatives, for example, like fertilizer, uh, maybe they use it, uh, if it's like uh, some, for example, rice, rice, straw, rice straw, right, from the uh, petty, petty field, uh, the, the, uh, we use it and submit it, send it to the uh, biomass uh, power plant to use it as a fuel in the process, like that, that is example. Uh, I would like to say uh, in conclusion about the research and study in Thailand, because as I mentioned earlier that PM2.5 is like from many, many source contribution. So we want to study and update thought profile that we have in Thailand so far. We don't have the clear picture of thought profiles at this time. And you know that it's different from uh, one city to the another city. For example, if we study in Bangkok, it may be different from Chiang Mai or different from other city in the northeastern part of Thailand. So we want to study about thought profile in specific area that we're interested in. And we want to study PM uh, particulate matter size distributions, uh, the ratio in different regions, uh, social impact assessment. Uh, and we want to study the core benefit assessment for air pollution and climate change management and measure. And uh, I think in Thailand, we're very active in transportation sector. Uh, we try to study uh, PM 2.5 reduction from diesel vehicles. For example, we want to study the effectiveness of these cell particulate filters. 
uh, someone may wonder why you want to study, for example, find this fusion, the ratio, because I think this related to health impact assessment. If we understand uh, where it come from, what is the composition of a degrade matter, it's uh, better to uh, study in terms of health risk assessment. And finally, I would like to end up with a challenge for PM 2.5 management, which I think it may go along well with the UNS cap intention. I think regional cooperation uh, is important because PM 2.5, we think, I mean, many more, I mean, uh, I think we all agree that it's a transboundary issues. So we have to have the regional cooperation, for example, Thailand and neighbor country. Uh, if we have, uh, I think we, we know that we have to work closely together. And at the regional level, uh, to share experience, I think it's also important because uh, uh, maybe com this community may have this experience and we may learn from the other communities from the other country as well. Uh, so for me, uh, research in common air pollution issues in this region is necessary. And that is uh, uh, the end of my talk, thank you. Great, Dr. Pat, thank you so much. And thank you for being sure to point out the transboundary issue of PM 2.5. And I am, we're all happy to hear that you're working on regional cooperation um, towards this problem. Uh, Dr. Pat, we do have a quick question here that I think you might be able to answer right away if I can stick with you. So we've talked a lot about open burning today and the emissions that that causes. Does Thailand have any, or does the pollution control department know which crops are doing which crops are burnt more most often so is it coffee crops or is it rice what are your fields that are burning and emitting pm 2.5 which uh uh it, it depends on the region because mm -hmm. uh, our agricultural uh factories we have a uh, for example, we have sugarcane in some province and the problem of open burning is from sugarcane. Some area is from uh, rice, I mean paddy field. So the problem of from open burning is from rice. So that's, that's, that's why we have to consider uh, region by region. And the uh, agency that involved, uh, I think the major uh, agency that involved in, in this is the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah. Because they have, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Dr. Pat. And I think um, we've spent a lot of time here talking about Thailand today between my presentation and uh, Dr. Pat's input. And I kind of want to, I want to pivot and I'd like to switch to uh, Dr. Satoro from Japan now. Hi, thank you. Oh, thank um, you. I think your ambassador actually in his introduction today made a really uh, strong point about how Japan overcame some of the emission problems that you had in the 70s. And I'm hoping that you can kind of get us up to speed on where Japan is today and what you guys are working on, especially when it comes to emission reg regulations. Um, and tell us just a little bit about where Japan's at and how you guys have had some successes in tackling your past air pollution problems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ah, okay, so thank you for your question. So as mentioned in the opening remarks, so air quality in Japan is very polluted in 1970s. So I'd like to talk about the progress uh, since that uh, decade. So before that, uh, monitoring is very important to uh, understand the air quality situation. So currently there are more than 1000 stations to monitor ambient mass concentration of criteria pollutant, including PM2.5. And also in addition, the monitoring of uh, PM2.5 component has started. So we found major component in 2.5 are sulfate, nitrate, and organic carbon. So most of them are secondary component, which are formed in the atmosphere from precursors through photochemical reaction. So therefore, it is very important to reduce precursors like SO2, NOx, and VOC 
in addition to primary emitted PM25, including uh, black carbon. So according to the monitoring, so ambient concentration of PM2.5 and precursors are gradually decreasing uh, since the uh, 1970s because of various strategies. And uh, air quality, air pollution control act is kind of a fundamental law to reduce emission from stationary sources. And also for mobile sources, particularly diesel trucks, very stringent emission controls and fuel quality controls are implemented. And also additional regulation and incentives were introduced to encourage earlier replacement of old vehicles and also retrofit of after treatment devices like uh, diesel particulate filters. And also for VOC, uh, voluntary action were introduced in this scheme. So emission sources can decide how to reduce emission VOC to meet the target. So these kind of strategies were very effective to reduce emissions of primary PM2.5, particularly black carbon and precursors like SO2, NOx and VOC. But some monitoring stations still violate uh, air quality standard of PM2.5. So more work is necessary, but formation mechanism, particularly secondary PM2.5 is very complex. So now we are working on reliable emission inventories and also regional air quality simulations, which can represent a photochemical reaction to identify key emission sources and also seek optimal strategies. So one of the issue is uh, transboundary transport. And this is not actually not an issue for only for Japan. So many people in Asian countries are now suffering from heavy air pollution. So Asian countries are strongly connected by economic activities. So that means uh, one country's import goods produce it in other countries. So pollutant emissions from production in these countries may be induced by other countries. So such kind of economic activities very, uh, and relationships very important to consider the uh, health impact on the Asian peoples. So I think uh, cooperation among Asian countries are very important in this context. So now Japanese government is doing various activities like ENET. This is a formerly aiming at acid rain, but now expanding the scope to various air quality issues. And also Japan, Thailand, clean air working uh, part partnerships, which is working on the monitoring emission inventories and air quality simulation. So we hope these kind of activities will contribute to better air quality in Thailand and also other countries in Asia. So thank you for your question. Right. And, and Dr. Starr, I wanna kind of follow up with you here on a question. You said something um, that I'd like to touch on uh, that in incentives were really helpful yeah. for Japan in battling um, your emissions. So can you tell us a little bit more about, about these incentives and which ones were most successful? Were these incentives for corporations or for individuals? Um, and what, what, what did you find worked best? Mm, this is actually very uh, good, but a difficult question to answer. Yeah. So <laughs> various scheme is very, I think, uh, very effective. So mm -hmm. not only in, uh, industry, also each uh, car owners to replace a vehicle or something like that. So various scheme is very, I think, uh, very effective, but not particularly one of them. So I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. Um, I want to move. I want to move on here now. We have Dr. Kim with us tech from AIT, the Asia Institute of Technology here in Bangkok. Dr. Kim. Um, yeah. Hello, I'm here. Hi. How are you? Um, so you are also an emission specialist as well. And a lot of your work is talking about uh, the interactions between air pollution and climate with a focus on kind of being able to quantify co-benefits, right? 
Um, and I'm hoping that you can tell our audience a little bit more about that and how you do that. And um, particularly maybe focusing on emissions here in Asia as well. Okay, thank you. So as uh, everyone mentioned already, Asia is the largest emitter of the air pollution and greenhouse gases. So we have key emission sector like traffic, industry, uh, residential combustion of land, construction, agricultural activity, etc. And it very much depends on the location and the domain. So which source is more important than others. So as we know that it combustion releases uh, greenhouse gases and also releases uh, air pollutants, like toxic air pollutants like particulate metals. So VOC including benzene, carbon monoxide, and semi VOC like carcinogenic compounds of uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So all of those are released from combustion along with knock on salts, et cetera. So, and then also we have key greenhouse gases, like CO2, methane, and 2O. So many toxic air pollutants in fact also have uh, climate causing effects. So like black carbon mentioned, uh, Samia mentioned, and because black carbon is black particles, so once it's in the atmosphere, it absorbs solar radiation and warm atmosphere directly. So that's why it's a very strong warming agent. And it also emitted from combustion activity. When we burn, we do not burn it properly, like from residential cooking or open burning or diesel vehicles uh, with a poor engine. The elite, uh, emits a lot of black carbon particles. So with that, actually, if we can do better combustion, we uh, burn it more efficiently, we burn it cleaner, so we would have less emission of own toxic uh, pollutants, greenhouse gases, and also less black carbon. Let's talk about short-lived climate pollutants here. So that's why it's talk about co-benefit. So when we talk about co-benefit, we normally start with emission inventory. We do emission inventory, so what are current status of emission? how much actually CO2 or greenhouse gases contributed by this scenario. And then if we have a what if scenario, it means if we actually have some control measure implemented, so how much would be uh, the reduction in terms of the greenhouse gases. And then we also quantify the short-lived climate pollutants like black carbon, which is warming agent. Organic carbon is cooling agent and VOC is a warming agent, for example. So we actually quantify that uh, climate impact of all that species, especially talking about ozone because uh, somebody uh, San also mentioned now ozone. The so ozone is formed from the precursor like VOC and NOx, and it's not directly emitted from the, the, the sources, but it forms in the atmosphere. And that tropospheric ozone is it, uh, toxic to human health and also toxic to plant and crops. That's why it can reduce the crop yield. And it's a strong greenhouse gas. So to, to develop a management strategy or quantify the co-benefit that we reduce like precursor uh, to ozone, that we really need very comprehensive emission inventory modeling tool in order to quantify that because the ozone is a chemistry is not linear, so it's not like straight from what. We reduce that, but we reduce ozone, sometimes it increases ozone. So we talk about co-benefit, that's why we do emission inventory and we actually do the model in order to simulate air quality and also to see if what if scenario, what what is implemented, how much would be the effect on the emission rate emission and then how much that is transformed in the ambient air quality. And with that, we quantify the impact, impact on crops using ozone as index, impact on human health using both uh, PM2.5 and also the, um, the, uh, the ozone, so that human health. So, and then for the emission remedy, we quantify black carbon. And we also try to use a black carbon in the model, in the module, in order to, to see how much warming 
potential of black carbon and what would be related to reduction if we actually could do some control measures. The, my, actually, the message I want to convey actually in order to reduce emission, so we need collective action from all stakeholders, everyone, every relevant stakeholder need to be committed. So talking about rice straw open burning, of course, we need to talk to farmers and farmers should understand that. And we need to have also support incentive for farmers from the policy, from different scheme to support the farmers. And of course, if you ban the burning, it wouldn't work that for long. But if you provide them alternative technology that can help them to actually uh, create some income for not burning rice straw, so that we can have win and win uh, solution here. And if we can reduce that, we also reduce a lot of uh, short-lived climate pollutants. So that's why we can also achieve both goal, actually also clean air and less climate forcing. Again, the issue with the, with the transboundary is really challenging. So this is not within a country, but it's between the country. So my, uh, the previous panelists also mentioned the uh, region cooperation. It's very, very important, especially in, in terms of the biomass, uh, like forest fire or what we happen in, uh, in Golden Triangle here, or like transboundary issue related to urban burning in Indonesia, for example. We really need region cooperation. It means the stakeholder here also include region cooperation. It's not only within the country. So the message is everyone, everyone needs to take part, stay committed from authority, policy makers, and from those who are doing polluting activity like farmer, or talk about the vehicle, the, like human like driving vehicle on the street. The way they drive also matters a lot. So that's why awareness raising, educative measure, policy measure, and technology measure all should be together in order to achieve clean air one. And at the same time, we have multiple benefits, including uh, climate benefit here. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input, Dr. Kim. Um, and we've, you know, we've spent some time here talking a lot about what we can do about uh, reducing the air pollution in the region um, from our perspectives, but also the public's perspective here is really important and reliable information is absolutely needed to mitigation measures um, to raise awareness and change behavior. I'd like to bring Karen on with us now to talk a little bit about this, her background with air paraf and monitoring networks in Paris that makes her an expert on, on this kind of public information. Um, and I want to know, uh, as the monitoring and air quality network for Paris, why and how do you use your data for public information? So what are you telling your people when you kind of, where are you getting it from and what have you found has resonated best? <laughs> That's a lot of question. Um, <laughs> people are looking for reliable information, uh, and especially with more and more micro sensors. And if they don't get it, uh, they make it on their own and they want to share it on their comparison between the different cities and the different parts in the world regarding air pollution. Um, air pollution information is absolutely needed because um, <clears throat> it supports binding mitigation measures uh, which have an impact on your daily life. Like in Paris, there is a low emission zone and you cannot drive old vehicles in case of pollution episodes, so you, you need to be informed. It's also absolutely needed to raise awareness and change behavior. Uh, regulation is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And if you want to go further in air quality improvement, uh, you need to have people aware of the situation and willing to change the behavior. Um, However, as it has been mentioned by, um, by, by my colleague from Japan, changing is not always easy and you need to understand why it's important to change, but you also need to have solution and sometimes incentive, incentives to support this change that can be 
quite important in, in your daily life or in your life life um, style. Um, as Dr. Kim said, um, every stakeholder needs to be committed. And for this, you need to inform also the different stakeholders and you need different support and different kind of information for each kind of stakeholder. Uh, it's not only the citizens, but it's also the decision makers because uh, they are in charge of designing, designing the mitigation plans. Um, and to address both air pollution and climate change, as it has been mentioned, it's, it's, it's very important to avoid an antagonism that like the choices that have been made in France to uh, in favor of diesel uh, or eating with biomass, which is a disaster regarding air pollution. Um, that's also the decision makers who have to ensure that the regulation is rectified respect it, uh, whereas we are in, in the situation or where there is multiplication of legal actions in Europe. Uh, for instance, in, in France, we have two with the European Commission and one with our own state council. And there are more NGOs um, having legal action regarding air pollution. So, in addition, uh, and this, which means that these information and those data, they can be used for court case. So you, you have to be sure about the quality of your data and the quality of information you provide. Um, in addition, for Paris region, air, good air quality is becoming a factor of attractivity to keep the workers uh, in Paris region, but also for, for tourism. Um, I think it's not only the question for Paris, but it's it's the question of attractivity for all large cities across the world. It's shared by our colleagues in, in Hanoi, in Beijing, in Bangkok. Uh, air quality also a factor of attractivity for, for our own citizens, but also for tourism. And this will be even more important after the pandemic, where the people will be even more looking for good air quality uh, to travel to. Um, you should also address the pollutant pollution emitters and the economical player. And what is interesting in Paris is that um, air pollution also became, I would say, um, a market issue. Uh, there are more and more solutions developed to monitor air pollution, to work an innovative solution of filtration, to decrease exposure to air pollution. And it's, it's not only a constraint, but it's also an opportunity for many, for many uh, economical players. Uh, of course, you have to inform uh, media and NGO, and it's also information, this information is also important to share experience with our counterparts in, in, in Asia, in, in Japan, in Beijing, in Hanoi, in Bangkok, um, in, but also in Cambodia or Laos. Um, it, it's very important to, to share the expertise the, on the lesson learned, um, and uh, we are also supported by the French Development Agency to, to promote this kind of cooperation. Um, I also would like to highlight that this information is no longer local or national, but it's becoming international. Uh, for instance, when the mayor of Paris decides to ban the traffic along the Seine River, there are international articles everywhere uh, in the States, in Asia, in Tehran. Um, but at the opposite, when there is a pollution episode in Beijing or in Hanoi, we also get questions from the media in Paris. How do we inform all these different stakeholders? Uh, you need different kind of, of, um, of uh, communication to address, address each kind of stakeholders. Um, it can be done, for instance, by us. Uh, we have a daily forecast. Uh, this is done to um, inform the citizens about their pollution, their breath to uh, enable them to reduce their exposure in case of pollution episodes, but it's also the opportunity to inform the authorities of what kind of episode we experience. And the episode can be quite different, uh, ozone during the summer, or particles during the winter, or right now um, for, for spring, uh, with different sources. And when you look at the composition of the particles, and when you look at the footprint, I, I like the idea of the footprint actually, you can and from the authorities about the source of the pollution episode. If is it a local pollution episode, it's, it's, if it's a regional pollution episode, it's always due to the traffic. But in addition to the traffic, you may also have biomass burning. You can, may also have um, agriculture or a little bit of industries. Um, 
There are also tools to develop uh, exposure and emission and apps and new technology for communication are very useful. We have, for instance, an app where the pedestrian and bicycle can calculate their trip to reduce uh, their exposure to air pollution. And um, thanks to IoT development, uh, the citizens, they also want to take part in, in the measurements and they want to share the data. It's a great opportunity to have them participate in the measures. And when doing studies with sociologists, we also realize that when they participate and when they look at the data, they also, they're also more aware about their pollution. And they, they also realize that not only the impact of their pollution on their health or their exposure, but they also realize that they can act and improve the situation. And that's also why we have developed training programs for citizens based on local census. Um, I may have a warning, uh, quality of the information is key to be trusted and to be used by these different stakeholders, um, because it's a question of, of health, it's a question of court case, it's a question, it's a political, it's a media, it's an economical question, so it, it's serious, <laughs> and we really have to to be aware about the quality of the data and especially with the multiplication of, of local census, we, we really have to, to put a focus on, on the quality of the data. And this is even more important given the pandemic um, we are experiencing because there is a link between air pollution and COVID-19. Maybe to finish with, um, information is key to use the cataclysm we are experiencing we are experiences um, as an opportunity to um, prioritize human life and to tackle environmental disaster. Um, it, it's not from the, this sentence is not for me, but it's from President Macron. It was one year ago uh, during the first lockdown. So um, let's use this cataclysm as an opportunity to, to change and to improve um, the environment and health of the citizens. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for all that information. And I'd like to just ask you one really quick follow-up question here. You touched on a lot of interesting things um, that I do want to dig into a little bit more. And I would like to talk to all of our panelists about their perspective on COVID-19 and air pollution in a moment. But Karen, you said you talked a little bit about quality of information and data and, and ensuring that. Can you maybe just give me one or two examples of how you in Paris are ensuring that your data and information is on point that you're putting out? We have, um, there are procedure, a European and national procedure yeah, that you have to follow to ensure the quality of your data with reference station. And with the multiplication of local census, we have developed a challenge to check the quality of the local census, depending mm. on the brands, depending on the use, because you have different um, reliability depending on the use. Uh, they are quite reliable for indoor measurements. Uh, they are really useful, as I mentioned, it to, um, to uh, improve uh, awareness, to raise awareness and citizens' participation. But you should be careful not to use them to check the regulation, for instance it's not reliable enough. Um, so that's how we proceed. We have the reference station and those reference stations, they also help us to check the quality of other kind of, of data. And everything is also linked with emission inventory and models uh, to, to run scenarios. And uh, it's checked with the national uh, authorities and it's also checked with the, our um, um, counterpart in the other region in France. And sometimes in, in Europe, and I would like to say hello to my colleagues from Milan, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for all of that information. Um, I, this is such a heavy topic to cover in 90 minutes, I know. So, so I appreciate you squeezing all that in. And we do have one big topic that I think I want each panelist to take about a minute to um, discuss. I'd like to start with Dr. Kim actually and discuss what's happening with research in COVID-19. I wanna open up with Dr. Kim because you're an educator. You have a ton of PhD and master's students, uh, future environmental scientists and air pollution crusaders with you. What is the reaction that you're feeling in the research world and what kind of shifts do you think we're gonna see with the COVID-19 recovery and how we're approaching air pollution? Dr. Kim? 
Thank you. Um, yes, so it's an interesting topic and a challenging topic now because uh, these days we talk a lot about how like lockdown would affect air quality and how the COVID, actually the air quality would affect severity of the COVID because research in China and Italy show that okay, the, the, the air pollution like PM, high pollution would help create more severe severity of the, the outbreak of COVID in that uh, certain location. And then we talk about how lockdown would affect air quality. And then people try to compare like air quality in uh, 2020 with uh, 19 and try to reveal. But then there are some primary pollutants we show some reduction, but secondary pollutants like ozone may not necessarily follow the same. So that is a very challenging research topic. And it's not simply to compare the level because when we talk about air quality, we also need to talk about the meteorology. So we need to harmonize, harmonize meteorological condition in order to talk about the air quality and emission. That is a very challenging research topic, of course. But of course, one of the key things here we can see that lockdown actually show that improvement of air quality worldwide, everywhere. And meaning that if we do some action, we can improve air quality. And that is a good message that we, we could actually take action and reduce the traffic. And of course, we don't reduce, want to reduce on the economic activity, but certain measures can be taken, like eliminate all vehicles on the street or reduce a motorcycle in Hanoi, for example, in order to have better air quality. And it's certainly very challenging and interesting research topic. And I know that also my group here, we started doing something for Southeast Asian country <laughs> and jointly with other colleagues in Malaysia, Thailand and Indonesia. So we want to reveal some like effect of the, the two way. So COVID on air quality and air quality, air pollution and severity of the, the COVID effects. So thank you for asking the question. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, let's move to Dr. Pat here from the BCD again. And I'd just like to quickly get your perspective on air pollution and COVID-19 and how you think Thailand, Thailand's research and development will maybe change in light of the pandemic. Okay, yeah, uh, maybe I mean, cannot answer, I, I may not answer the question directly, but if you talk about uh, COVID-19 and air quality, uh, PCD, uh, as a PCD, we know that uh, if we compare the data between PM 2.5 level uh, during the episode of COVID-19, we found that the level of PM 2.5 is lower. So we, if we think in a positive way, you know, uh, we found that the level of air pollution in, in some parameter is less, less than uh, if we don't have the episode. The benefit, I mean, I, I said in positive thinking, uh, the benefit of that is that when we collect the sample, we know the difference between, uh, I mean, like composition uh, during the COVID-19 episode and not yeah, during COVID-19. So we can find that which indicator that will related to maybe health effect that we can uh, study uh, contribution in that direction. So, Maybe it cannot say that it uh, any uh, good or bad, but we we think we can uh, do something that we will get what we call the win-win situation. That that's just my uh, personal opinion. Thank you, Dr. Pat. And I'm noticing here that we are running out of time, so I want to go really quickly to Xavier um, and get your final and closing thoughts for today, uh, Dr. Mari. Yes. Well, if you are, I have to be very brief, though. So, but in my opinion, the pandemic has several effects. But one of the effects on scientific research is first that it has significantly reduced funding opportunities to for research activities that are not related to the pandemic by re redirecting the, the fund to, toward the fight against the COVID. 
but I think it has uh, it has been said a bit before, but I think it has a very positive effect actually, because the pandemic forced all of us to realize that air pollution was linked to human activities, and the, well, we all noticed that the pace of human activity has significant, significantly uh, slowed down in 2020. So we observe a, a, a drop of global GDP growth by by five percent at the global scale. A, a, de a decrease in emission of carbon dioxide by about 7%. And the PM2.5 concentration in world's largest city decreased by an average of about 10% in, two, in 2020 in, the, in the, the main cities. So in other words, if we want to reach the goal of the Paris Agreement to limit climate warming below 1.5 degrees, and if we want to reach average PM2.5 concentration in large and polluted ASEAN cities that are in line with the recommendation of the World Health Organization, we will need to experience an additional COVID heavy year for the next 10 years. I repeat, 10 years, every year, one more COVID. Not the same one, one additional one. So the COVID crisis probably helped us to understand what it will take to reach sustainability of our societies. Thank you, and thank you for being so quick. And I want to bring Dr. Satoro on as well for closing thoughts and thoughts about COVID-19 and air pollution. Dr. Satoro. Yeah, actually, I have very similar uh, comment with other uh, researchers. So I'm working on emission inventory and air quality simulation. So simulation can uh, get, uh, we can get uh, any time answer from the simulation. So we have to validate the simulation result. So this is kind of very good opportunity to link the actual emission reduction with uh, air quality improvement. So we would like to uh, uh, focus on such kind of link between emission to uh, with uh, air quality situation to find the key sources and also consider effective strategies. Thank you. Thank you. And before we move into our closing remarks, unfortunately, we're not going to have time for a Q&A today, but we will follow up with these questions I'm seeing in the chat. Karine, I just want to give you a moment for um, your final thoughts. Um, for me, the, the pandemia, unfortunately, demonstrates that we can make it. Uh, with the lockdown in Paris, we have a decrease of 50% in NO2 close from the traffic. 30% in CO2 emissions, um, not that much for particles because we still had a lot of heating on agriculture, uh, which shows that where we don't, when we don't do anything, it, we don't decrease the pollution. And we even had benefit on very small particles, ultra fine particles that can be as tiny as a molecule of DNA and it, they were decreased by 30%. However, the pandemic also raises questions. Uh, the people, they don't want to take any more the public transport and the traffic is back to normal. So um, it's both a constraint and an opportunity and it's up to us to uh, know what we want to do for the world after the pandemic. <laughs> You know, and that's a great point that I've never thought of, that people aren't going to be taking as much public transportation. And I think that's a really interesting thought. Um, I do want to welcome, we have Dr. Maria Narai with us today for closing thoughts. Um, Dr. Maria is the Director of the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health at the World Health Organization. She's coming in to us today from Geneva. It's an honor to have you with us and I'd like to hand the floor to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Abigail, and uh, thank you all. Uh, the honor is mine. I mean, uh, I have been following all the interventions and it's really a pleasure to, to realize that uh, all together we have so much, so much knowledge, experience, and actually I can even say that I think we have all the solutions in our hands. It's true, air pollution is one of the biggest public health problems we are confronting today. If you, I think this horrible figure that we are not repeating enough, the 7 million premature deaths cause every year due to exposure to air pollution. This is a figure that, uh, I mean, uh, is, is, is so dramatic that sometimes it's even difficult to, to figure out what is happening. This is a kind of 
a, a pandemic on a slow motion. This is a, a volcano every year, and this is something which is absolutely unacceptable. Seven million premature deaths that could be prevented. And in fact, we have the figures, we have the estimates, we have the science, we, we know how to assess the sources of pollution. You, you have described all of those tools. We know how to do an inventory of, of the sources and the emissions inventory. We know how to monitor. We have been reviewing, uh, you have been re reviewing all together the different uh, solutions that are available. Uh, how this circular economy or, or the different solutions that will provide better results have already been, been proved. We have different tools even to calculate how many lives we could save, depending on which measure we, we apply. Um, I didn't hear much, but I'm sure that you, you are extremely familiar with the RQ plus uh, from WHO, the, the heat or, or the, the, the carbon age, and all of those tools that we, we have to estimate the impact on, on the health of the people by exposure to air pollution, short and long term, and as well, the health benefits of stopping the use of, of coal, for instance. So we have a, a, a huge public health problem, but a, a confronted to other public health for which we don't have all the solutions. Here, I think we have it. In addition to that, I think I am hearing that we are all in agreement that this could be the opportunity to tackle the pollution, to tackle the causes of climate change, because at the end, there is a 75% of overlap between the causes of uh, global warming and air pollution, which is burning fossil fuels. And we need to uh, stop burning fossil fuels. So we are all in agreement as well that we have the opportunity to do a better uh, uh, economic recovery after COVID-19, uh, a recovery from the point of view of health, reducing our vulnerability as human beings by stopping to pollute our environment, to destroy, destroy our ecosystems by, by still uh, make, uh, that barrier between the, the, the human health and animal health has been totally destroyed. So we have an opportunity to do a better sustainable uh, development, to repair all of those terrible systemic failures that uh, through COVID we have been able to discover. Probably those of us who have been working on air pollution for many years, we knew that they were already very strong systemic failures that we need to address. But if this is not the opportunity to correct all of those systemic failures, I don't know when. It's clear that we need to review two things, in my opinion. One, the level of ambition that we have. It's true that many countries had, had agreed to become a carbon neutral in 2050. And for that, we need to take a series of decisions. Is this enough? I mean, my question is, if we reduce air pollution today, we could save 7 million premature deaths. More you prolong in the time, we need to be prepared to, to, to accept the number of deaths or the lives that we are not saving or the economy that we are not contributing to recover. Because here we have an opportunity, as I say, to recover from, for, from a health point of view, from an economic point of view. We have plenty of arguments telling us that if you invest $1 on, on fossil fuel, uh, or $1 on renewable energy, you will be creating jobs on renewable energy while eventually you will create one on fossil fuels. We have the option as well. We saw that all the interventions that are proposing, they work, no secrets, no magic. The moment we stop the traffic in the most polluted and the most uh, uh, densely, uh, densely populated cities around the world, we saw that the, the sky could be blue, something that in New Delhi, they, they, for them it was something absolutely new and a, and a big discovery. They didn't know that the, the, the sky could be blue. Uh, so we have an incredible opportunity. I think the public health community at large, I intend all of those who have been presenting today uh, from a political point of view, from a government point of view, from a scientific point of view, from an academic point of view, all of us, we have now a major 
uh, responsibility, not only opportunity, responsibility to make sure that everybody understands that if we want a, an economic recovery after COVID, if we want to make sure that we reduce the vulnerability of our populations in order to be better prepared for the next pandemic or the next crisis that it will be climate change, the next crisis, we need to, as I say, two things. We need to accelerate the speed at which we implement the Paris Treaty, we put in place the, 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 the um, uh, interventions to reduce, to tackle air pollution, and as well, we implement, increase the level of ambition. These two things, speed and ambition. Uh, and, and I think we have the citizens behind us at the moment because they suffer a lot with the, the COVID-19. They have been terrified. They, they saw their economies to be completely destroyed, their mental health affected, the, the health of their people at risk. And now they don't want to go through that again. And I think that they are more receptive than ever to positive arguments. Of course, they don't, they don't, we, they don't want to be um, terrified again by terrible arguments saying the next crisis will be worse. But if we put it in positive, we say if we tackle the causes of climate change, we will reduce the pollution. And by doing that, we will reduce the probabilities for you to, to, to die and to be more vulnerable. We will reduce mortality as well. Those are positive arguments. If we do so, we will our economy will be more sustainable, more acceptable, and, and probably will help us very much to fight against the poverty that is now unfortunately announcing very strongly. So I want to thank you so much for, for, for your expertise, for the awareness that you are raising around the world at the moment, for being so advanced on all the solutions we are you are proposing. And uh, my call to all of you will be that in COP26 this year, this cannot be again a place where people talk and propose and then they have uh, uh, debates until three o'clock in the morning and the big head headlines in the newspapers. It has to be the moment where we present the health argument uh, as a very strong one to motivate more action, more ambition and more speed on tackling the causes of climate change and air pollution and therefore advancing on this agenda that it looks only logic, common sense, and, and, and something that we can all gain dramatically. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. P please keep uh, pushing and join us as WHO on the um, big report we will do for the COP26 call the health argument for more climate action. We count on all of you on making sure that uh, this uh, COP will not only be an environmental uh, uh, convention, is, it is the biggest public health treaty ever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panelists, to everybody that gave introductory remarks today, and to all of our attendees for taking time out of your very busy schedules for what is an extremely important topic and clearly impossible to cover in 90 minutes. We will follow up with you um, and send through some of the information from today. If you need more information, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And please do remember, clear skies, for um, clean skies for blue skies day on 7th September. Um, we'll have more information and more activities then. Thank you so much for everyone who joined today in Insight Pack for technically facilitating. Thank you all. I will go ahead and end the webinar now. Thank you.